Hello, my name is Selena Truman and I'm here to introduce a film about the principles of the Mental Capacity Act. The purpose of this film is to try and show a practical example of how you can put into place some of the key principles around how to use the Mental Capacity Act for all of our staff who work in our trust. The film's about how we should be supporting patients to have choices and make decisions about the care and treatment we provide including asking for their consent. The film is also about what we need to do if a patient can't make a decision or give consent. Being given choices and making decisions is something we all do. If we have a health problem, we are often given choices about the care or treatment we could receive. We may be asked to make a decision or give our consent. Sometimes those decisions can be difficult about the health problems, care or treatment is complicated. We would expect to be given clear information about the health problem and the choices we have about care and treatment. We may well ask family or friends for advice. As adults, we also know we have the right to refuse consent if we don't want a particular treatment. Our ability to make decisions, give or refuse consent, is called mental capacity. The Mental Capacity Act explains how people should be supported to make their own decisions, how to assess mental capacity and what to do if someone lacks mental capacity. It's a law that healthcare staff and professionals must follow, but it's not complicated and it's both important and helpful for staff, patients and carers. Some people who use our health service and hospitals may have particular difficulties making decisions or giving consent. That's where the Mental Capacity Act helps. Let's think about a couple of typical examples. Mr Jones has early stage Alzheimer's disease. As Mr Jones is incontinent, has been losing weight and has mobility problems, he is at risk of developing pressure ulcers. Mr Jones has just been discharged from hospital following treatment for a urine infection post a fall at home. Mr Jones was referred to the district nurse for pressure area care. This is the second time the district nurse has visited Mr Jones and he has repeated that he does not want to be messed around with or be examined. Mr Jones has not given consent for his care. The district nurse informs Mr Jones she has to seek further advice from her colleagues. How might this situation have been addressed differently? How could the Mental Capacity Act help? The district nurse recorded in the Rio notes that Mr Jones did not give consent to be assessed. Later that morning, the district nurse sought advice from the community tissue viability nurse. The district nurse reports that Mr Jones has refused to let her assess the condition of his skin. The tissue viability nurse challenges the view that Mr Jones has capacity to refuse consent and advises the district nurse to return to the patient and follow the principles of the Mental Capacity Act and record what Mr Jones has said in response to the open questions regarding his assessment and treatment. The first principle of the Mental Capacity Act says you should assume people have capacity to make decisions. That's what the district nurse did. But did the district nurse really check whether the patient had capacity to refuse consent, especially that he had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? What would be the consequences of refusing consent? The reasons for moving Mr Jones to assess his skin integrity needed to be explained to him in ways that he could understand. The second principle of the Mental Capacity Act emphasises the importance of helping people to make a decision by giving them the information in ways they can understand. It's important to ensure that the discussion takes place in an environment that the person is comfortable in. Is the person being asked to make the decision at a time of day when they are most alert? Could the decision be delayed to allow this to happen? The way information can be explained should follow the process of a mental capacity assessment as described in the Mental Capacity Act. Does the patient understand, retain and use the information given to him to make a decision? Ask the patient to repeat back the information. Say why he doesn't want to be moved. 
or indicate he understands the consequences of not being moved. For example, the possible development of a pressure ulcer. Although Mr Jones doesn't need to say he understands all the technical details, he is at risk of developing pressure ulcers if he is not moved. These are the ways of finding out if Mr Jones has capacity. If the treatment option has been explained to the patient in a way the patient appears to understand, it may be that the patient does have capacity. If the patient continues to decline care, the Mental Capacity Act states this is called an unwise decision. An unwise decision or decision that someone else disagrees with isn't proof of lacking capacity. But even if it's an unwise decision, it would be important not just to assume this without recording it as a capacity assessment. I spoke to the patient about why we needed to move him and asked him to repeat back what I said to check he could hear me. Mr Jones was able to repeat the words but then talked to me about resuming his job as a carpenter. Mr Jones was unclear of who I was and he thought I had arrived to read his gas meter. Mr Jones could not use the information to make a decision so he appeared to lack capacity. It seems more likely with this patient that he lacks capacity. This needs recording as well. It only needs a few sentences saying how the nurse tried to help him make the decision, taking into account his dementia and in what way the patient was unable to make the decision, such as not being able to understand, remember or weigh up the information to make the decisions. If the patient lacks capacity, a best interest decision could be made that he needs moving. This must be recorded in the patient's note. But remember, checking if he has capacity to consent should be done every time staff go to move the patient. People's mental capacity can fluctuate, so capacity assessment needs to be decision specific at the time a decision or consent is required. The example we have been given is about pressure ulcer care, but imagine the same thing happening involving admission to hospital or serious medical treatment. In these situations, it may be the person has capacity and has their own reasons for refusing consent, but the consequences could be very serious. It would be vital to do a proper capacity assessment and to record it, to establish if it's an unwise decision or if the patient actually does lack capacity. This film is about the consequences of assuming someone has capacity without doing a proper capacity assessment. If you are unsure about how the Mental Capacity Act might apply in a situation with patients with care and support needs, contact the Adult Safeguarding Team or go to the Adult Safeguarding intranet page. There is more detailed guidance about how to use the Mental Capacity Act in these situations, including a Mental Capacity Assessment form to guide you through doing an assessment and examples of capacity assessments.